saw a uh, I saw a weather report this morning. It said um, Southerners don't travel unless absolutely necessary, and Northerners use a heavy coat. So I don't know how many of you are from north of the Mason-Dixon line or south of the Mason-Dixon line, but at least you either found your heavy coat or you're one of those people who just like to run between your car and the house and the church and things like that. But I'm glad you braved our, our chilly weather uh, to be with us here this morning. In fact, I'm very pleasantly surprised with the turnout. I kind of wondered whether or not it might discourage people for you know, a little more than it obviously has this morning. So, welcome. It's good to see you. As you can see, we're going to be continuing in our story, uh, dealing with Samuel and Saul now, and uh, seeing how God's plan is going to begin to unfold. I don't like that. Oops, okay. <laughs> it, it just flashed away. I was like, don't do that. So, <clears throat> I do like the story. The story's great. You know, got some good things in here. Before we begin, uh, what uh, prayer request might you want to mention or praises? Hi. Yes, Barbara. Yeah. Yes. Now she's the one who's got cancer, cancer. and is not safe. All right. I'm working on it, but All I don't right. have it. I'm not approaching, but sure. I'm going to We'll continue to pray for that. Yes, Maria. For Ariel, she uh, found a home for her dog, we think, and so she was very concerned about that. She was going to look okay. down the stairs and take care of us. Okay. It's a praise. <laughs> it is praise, but not adjustment. <laughs> okay. All right. Yes, you know. Yes, they are back. Right. I guess they came back with uh, some cold, so a little under the weather. But So they're not going to be with us today, I understand. But they are back safe and sound, so I have to work for that. Well, I can add kind of a, a prayer request, too. Um, um, my daughter-in-law, Rui, is at the hospital or birthing center right now, very much hoping to have the baby. I think this is their third trip in the last few days. <laughs> Maybe a little bit of wishful thinking there. I'm not sure. But anyway, um, um, they're there. They actually spent most of the night there, but we haven't heard anything yet this morning. So hopefully that means that Things are progressing. This is their fourth. We live in the basement area of the house, and they have three little ones up there, and those three older older ones are going to be with us this morning, Lord willing, once Karen figures out how to get them all headed in the same direction, you know. <laughs> and uh, that will be good. So she also was interesting last couple of days because Katrina and James also went away on a Kind of a pastoral retreat. They go to Hampton Park, and James is a part of one of their lay pastors, and so they went away. So she was watching their four, and um, and then the other morning when Danny and Rui did a run down there, they dropped off their two young, younger ones. Actually, she had taken Elizabeth along, so she was watching five, and then they dropped off two, and then they came back and got theirs again and went back home because <laughs> nothing happened with the baby. But Karen had quite the daycare for a while. So we're thankful for our, our family and grandchildren. But do be in prayer for Rui. All right. Well, let's go ahead and uh, go to prayer, and then we'll go ahead and jump into uh, First Samuel here. Father, we do thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for how you demonstrate that to us every day. We do thank you for the ability to be here this morning. We pray for those who are not feeling well or can't be here, that you would help them to heal and so they can uh, resume their normal activities, and also rejoin us in fellowship. We pray that your hand would be upon all that's said and done today, and that you'd be honored and glorified, and that each one of us would be encouraged in our spiritual walk. I do pray, Lord, for some that are mentioned today. We think of Dennis. Thank you that Barbara has a heart to reach him, and we pray that you would be working in his heart and mind to help him understand the gospel and to respond to it. We always pray that you would be Ariel as she's adjusting to this life change in regard to her dog. We pray that you'd continue to be close to her. We do thank you for helping with that situation. And we do thank you again for our church, each person that you've brought here. And we pray that we would have a, a time today that uh, would be beneficial for all of us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 
Well, we're in a section of 1 Samuel dealing with the uh, transition of Israel from a, a theocracy, uh, that's a form of government, you know, led by God, uh, and he would lead through appointed people like the judges, like Samuel, and it's transitioning to a monarchy, which obviously is a form of government led by a human king. You'll remember that back in chapter 8, the elders had concerns about Samuel's sons, whom he had also appointed as judges. Now, they would have multiple judges. It wasn't just one at a time, necessarily. It was a big area. There would be multiple judges and, you know, helping to oversee things. I even heard one, one pastor that I highly respect was was uh, talking about Samuel and said that he may actually have overlapped with Samson, which we usually don't think about it. You know, the stories are kind of in this order, and we things are presented kind of one at a time. We don't necessarily see the timeline over the overlap. There could even have been an overlap with, with some of his judge time. But he's the primary judge, at least in this area of Israel at the time. He'd appointed his sons. They were not doing well as justice. The Bible says they accepted bribes and perverted justice. And so finally the elders of Israel met with Samuel and they re requested a king. Well, Samuel was displeased and went to the Lord for guidance. And you see that pattern with Samuel consistently where he keeps going to the Lord. I mean, it's amazing this relationship that they have. It's not just one-sided. It's like they really commune back and forth, and it's just kind of has stood out to me, you know, in these chapters about him. So it goes to him for guidance, and the Lord gives him a warning to pass on to the people about the difficulties that would come if they had a king. The people refused to listen to the warning, so Samuel then conferred with the Lord again, and the Lord granted the people's request, and, uh, then, sent, and then Samuel sent the elders home. So at that point, it became Samuel's task to anoint a king from among the Israelites. And um, we don't know exactly how much time passes between chapter 8 there and that elder meeting and the events that we see in chapter 9. We're not told. Probably wasn't a long time. No, need, no reason to think there was a long time. But sometime later, God uses a series of events to bring... Saul to Samuel, and the Lord also communicated clearly. He tells Samuel that Saul is the one who is to be king. While doing research for this lesson, I came across a slide presentation that I thought you might appreciate. Saul meets Samuel the prophet. Kish the Benjamite had a son named Saul. Saul was so handsome, bright, and very, very tall. Remember, I, I'm a grandfather, you know. Kish's prized donkeys got lost. He told Saul to search the grounds. Take my servant and find my donkeys. They could get hurt. They must be found. Saul and the servant searched the grounds. They looked high and low, but the donkeys couldn't be found. Saul told the servant, we'd better head home. Our father will worry, so we'd better scurry. The servant told Saul, the prophet Samuel lives near. Let's visit him. He listens to God and will tell us what he hears. We will ask him where the donkeys can be found. Then we can bring the donkeys back home safe and sound. So they looked for a while and saw some girls at a well. Saul asked, is the prophet nearby? Yes, he is, the girls replied. He is in the town for the sacrifice and the people are waiting. He will feast with the people and give us God's blessing. Hello, Saul. I am Samuel the priest. God told me you would come. Let's both go to the feast. Your father's donkeys got lost. You searched the grounds, but your donkeys are already home. They have been found. God spoke to Samuel that Saul would be king. But Samuel knew that Saul was tired, so they sat down and ate at the feast. Tomorrow, Samuel will tell Saul that he will be king. As the first king of Israel, God's hope he will bring. So I thought that was kind of kind of cute. And now that that wraps up our lesson, we're going <laughs> to... <laughs> and I always appreciate, for those of you who work especially in children's church or Sunday school or different things, this free Bible images site has cute little things like that, and they're all biblically sound. But we'll dig in just a little bit more to chapter 9, and we'll begin here with uh, verses 15 to 17. 
Now the Lord had told Samuel the previous day, about this time tomorrow I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him to be the leader of my people Israel. He will rescue them from the Philistines, for I have looked down on my people in mercy and have heard their cry. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said, that's the man I told you about. He will rule my people. So in these verses, we see that God tells Samuel that Saul is the man who will be king. Again, we have to be impressed with this close relationship between Samuel and Saul. Um, I, I'm sorry, between Samuel and the Lord. Now Saul has no apparent relationship with the Lord. We, we don't know his heart, but there's no indication in here that he really has much going for him. He's not even aware of Samuel, who had been serving for years and was a very effective and faithful, you know, uh, priest and judge. Actually, it was interesting because he was of the tribe of Levi, and he served, he was one of the few who served as both a priest and a judge. That's why you hear him talking about uh, offering a feast, a sacrifice, and later on, you know, he's, he's a person who does do sacrifice. Not all judges sacrifice, but um, he was one who was the tribe of Levi and did both. So we have... Um, Saul, as I said, has no, no apparent relationship with the, the, the Lord. So um, as one commentary put it, it says, so God spoke to Saul through lost donkeys. But Samuel knew and loved the Lord, so God spoke to Samuel directly. Now that first phrase, now the Lord had told Samuel, is literally um, from a Hebrew phrase, had uncovered his ear. Now, the idea of that is for a person to come up to another, push aside their headdress, and whisper in their ear. And so, so that's why it means uncovered, uncovered his ear. So you push it back in order to whisper. So those who knew Hebrew and the customs would realize that the Lord had secretly told Samuel. That's important because it does not mean that Samuel heard an audible voice from God. Okay? It was something that he knew was coming from God, but didn't have to hear an audible voice to, to know when God was speaking to him. There's several important details given here. It says about this time tomorrow. And so God gave the prophet Samuel specific guidance, you know, regarding future events. And saw Samuel received this guidance wisely, and, and he looked for the fulfillment of the, of the words to confirm God's choice of a king. So he's just looking to see, how is the Lord going to be performing this? He's confident that God is faithful and will work in his life. You never see him doubting God. And if you think about this whole story of Samuel and Saul, you see that with Saul later on. He never becomes confident in his relationship with God. And he second guesses, and like even when he was supposed to wait for Samuel for the sacrifice. It's like he didn't get there. What am I going to do? And he goes ahead with the sacrifice, which he shouldn't have done, you know. And other times when he second guessed instructions that were given to him, you don't see that as Samuel. He's a great example of someone who believes God, is confident in his relationship. He knows God's going to do what he said. There is also um, a very important idea presented here in verse 16 with the idea of, I will send you a man. That, that's an indication that we should remember, you know, that God is in control still. Now, Israel had rejected the Lord as their king. I mean, the Lord said to Samuel, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. But that doesn't mean that, you know, he's off the throne just because Israel didn't want him there. I mean, he's... He's not, it's not going to be functioning as a true theocracy, you know, direct information from him to someone to communicate to the people, but um, he still had a plan for them, and he would give them a king. But we do have a situation here where it appears again that he kind of gives them a king kind of on their level, a kind of a flawed king for a flawed Israel. But that doesn't mean that Saul was doomed to be a failure. He had a chance to follow God, and he had Samuel's continued guidance for a number of years. 
but unfortunately, he often rejected both. And then we also have this last part here about he will rescue them from the Philistines. For I have looked down on my people in mercy and have heard their cry. That's also a significant statement there as well. Why do I say that? We know they've had continual battles with the Philistines. It was mentioned even earlier. And then he's going to rescue them. <laughs> so he is going to rescue them. And, and he's going to use Saul to do it. And so again, you know, we look at Saul and we see all his failures, but God did have a job for Saul to do. Now the people were discouraged with Samuel's sons, but they were also plagued by the Philistines and others, you know, around them. And again, you may remember that some of this was the consequence of them not obeying God completely when they came into the promised land. They were supposed to clear the promised land entirely. And they didn't do that. And so they're kind of living with some long-term consequences of that. But God, you know, often showed himself faithful in regard to those battles. Unless, of course, they were doing it the wrong way, as we saw earlier in the book, in which they took the ark and weren't really dependent on God at all, but you know, kind of doing things in their own way. And he allowed them to have a defeat to try to teach them a lesson and to bring to pass what he had said, too, about that situation. But God does care about his people. He did have a job for Samuel to do. And, and even though there were many problems with the reign of, of Saul, you, well, you shouldn't think of it as a total disaster because he, he led Israel to many military victories and greater independence from the Philistines. And so his early years, he actually did accomplish you know, some very good things. And then we see um, another phrase here again in verse 17 about when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said, so the day after God told Samuel about the coming of the new king, God specifically fulfilled his word and he identified the man to Samuel. So again, we have this very interesting scenario as to how the Lord was bringing Samuel and Saul together. Saul's looking for the seer, as it says in verse 18. Just then Saul approached Samuel at the gateway and asked, can you please tell me where the seer's house is? And it just so happens that, I don't mean that in a, <laughs> in a you know, lucky sense, but it, it happens that it is Samuel. So he says, I'm the seer. And then he gets right into this statement. And sometimes, you know, scripture has these very succinct passages, passages you know, with kind of like, you know, just the facts. And um, I'm not saying that it was necessarily longer what he's saying here, but it's very condensed. And it has a tendency sometimes for us to kind of miss a little bit of what's happening or not have a full appreciation of it because it's not really commenting on maybe, you know, um, other details uh, that could perhaps be going on. Like, so just think about this reply. I am the seer. seer. Um, Saul's coming in to ask him about where his donkeys are. And Samuel says, go up to the place of worship ahead of me. We will eat there together, and in the morning I'll tell you what you want to know and send you on your way. And don't worry about those donkeys that were lost three days ago, for they have been found. And I am here to tell you that you and your family are the focus of all Israel's hopes. Okay, remember, Saul's just wondering about his donkeys. And he suddenly gets all this information so condensed, he's probably having a hard time processing one thought after another. Because it's like, didn't know I was going to uh, eat, you know, and I'm going to stay at his house, and he sent me on my way, and the donkeys are found, and uh, I'm the focus of all Israel's hopes. What's this all about? So he absolutely must have been amazed. I mean, he's looking for this noted prophet, and the first man he asked about the prophet was the prophet. Then the, then the man of God invited him to dinner. And then he said that in the morning, 
I'll tell you what you want. So that must have surprised Saul too. He hadn't even asked anything yet. And it may have made him a little nervous since it appears that uh, Samuel could, you know, read his mind. I'll tell you what you want to know. And you, that's going to be interesting. And then, of course, then he told him about the donkeys, which is what Saul thought he wanted to know. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting how this is here. I'll tell you what you want to know. Saul's thinking, about my donkeys? No, because he tells him about the donkeys next. So there's something else here that's coming. And so he tells him about the donkeys and gives that, you know, detail about how they were lost, that were lost three days ago, been found. So with these kind of details, with this kind of statement, he's proving to Saul that he's a true man of God. Because he knows things, details, that he probably could not have known unless it was revealed to him supernaturally which it was, in his communication uh, with God. And so, <clears throat> and then of course, you know, that, that last statement there, again, about, I'm here to tell you that you and your family are the focus of all Israel's hopes. I mean, all that's going on, and then Samuel hints at Saul's destiny. Now, we have been told here that all Israel desired a king. So, and we do know where this story is going, so we know that the focus of all Israel's hopes is referring to being a king. But I kind of wonder if, if he understood that implication there, or whether he just took it as, you know, I'm supposed to be something, someone very important, or did he get a little impression that, that maybe, you know, he's supposed to be king? But we know there's more information coming in the morning, and um, and so, you know, he's just got all this kind of dumped on him at once, and it must have been a very surprising encounter. <laughs> and he's just thinking all along, I was just looking for my donkeys. <laughs> <clears throat> so Paul, Saul has an interesting response here. He replies and says, but I'm only from the tribe of Benjamin, the smallest tribe in Israel, and my family is the least important of all the families of that tribe. Why are you talking like this to me? What do you think of that response? What's that? You could say it has a measure of, uh, of humility there. You can give, give credit when credit is due. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's actually an indication that he could be pushing back there. Because this is not an entirely true statement. I mean, we were told early on that his father was very prominent in the tribe of Benjamin. And even though it's not mentioned here, we're told elsewhere in Scripture that the Benjamites actually were great warriors. And so it doesn't completely, you know, ring true there. And, of course, we know how the story is going to continue. Do you remember what happens when... Saul, Samuel's trying to anoint Saul king. Remember how he runs off, hides? <laughs> you know, so there's a bit of adjustment here. This is an interesting thing. The Lord is extremely gracious with Saul to get him established and help him understand that he's with him. Some of that's coming up in this next week. And uh, Samuel just tells him all these things that's going to happen to him. And um, Saul experiences those things. But still, when it comes time to crown him king, he's you know, hiding in the sheep or wherever he went. So we do have him uh, pushing back. I think that that is a good way to put it. I mean, to tell you the truth, I'm surprised that Saul could even speak after all that you know, he had just been told. Um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, I think we give a, Saul a little bit of grace here because he probably was quite dumbfounded and had no idea, you know, why he and his family should suddenly be, you know, vaulted into a position of high importance.
it did seem that some of these people were prophets in the sense that they could foretell or knew some of this information. But you know, one of the struggles throughout the scripture has been those who would be false prophets or false seers. I'm sure there were those who were happy to abide by the custom of receiving you know, a gift for their services and then say something <laughs> that would satisfy. You know, that's been an age-old practice. And so, but, I mean, there, Samuel at least had that reputation, and there, and there may be some of the other judges serving or other religious leaders that maybe the Lord had, had given that ability during this, this time as well. But, uh, and you're right, it's interesting that he doesn't question that. So, but, you know, again, I can, I can just, as I look at this and I meditate, I was like, this guy m must basically be feeling like, <laughs> his kind of mind is blown here. Well, 22 to 24, <clears throat> we have this unfolding a little bit more. And uh, after being told this infor information, which is rather overwhelming, we see that then Samuel takes Saul and his servant into the hall and placed them at the head of the table, honoring them above the 30 special guests. Samuel then instructed the cook to bring Saul the finest cut of meat, the piece that had been set aside for the guest of honor. So the cook brought in the meat and placed it before Saul. Go ahead and eat it, Samuel said. I was saving it for you even before I invited these others. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. So this is interesting, because Samuel makes certain that Saul is honored at the feast, but he doesn't necessarily explain to the other people at the time why he's honoring him, why he's at this, this, in this seat of honor. And of course, the servant's going along for the ride, and he's right there by Saul, and this is a good, good meal for him, because he probably, you know, very seldom gets treatment like that. And, um... <clears throat> but it does specifically point out that Samuel included the, the servant and placed them, you know, in this, this seat of honor. It was always on a particular side next to the host. It was a great honor to be seated next to the prophet Samuel. And, um, and so that alone is pretty amazing. And then we have this interesting scenario where he tells the cook to bring Saul the finest cut of meat. And he had anticipated this had it set aside, and uh, we have Samuel talking about that. I was saving it for you even before I invited these others. So, so he has enough communication from the Lord to plan this feast and to be thinking ahead in regard to some of the significant things that would honor Saul here. So um, it kind of gives us a little bit of a look into some practices here. This is just kind of an aside. In this situation, as I said, Samuel was of the house of Levi. He could offer sacrifices, and he did. And the sacrifices, apparently, at least certain types of sacrifices, were offered in different locations, not just one. And this was a situation where they had a place of worship, kind of referred to as something like a high place. And later on, those would often be abused with idolatrous worship. And so later on, you'll remember... I think it was Hezekiah had destroyed a bunch of them and tried to do it away. But this town apparently wasn't abusing it at this time, but we're using it as a gathering place. And it was a place that had a place for the sacrifice, and it had a place for um, them to feast. Now that goes hand in hand, because a lot of times we think that you have a sacrifice, and so you have your sheep, your bull, or whatever it is that's being burned, and that it's just completely burned up. Well, occasionally there would be one that would be completely devoted to God and completely burned up. But most of the time, it was, in a sense, kind of cooked. You know? Right. You had a barbecue. You even had, and, you, and they, would pull, they would have it on there long enough so that the fat would be burned off. That was the Lord's portion. And then there would be certain amounts that, you know, they could take. And that would be used for the Levites and their families. That was a very significant means of support, you know, for the priest. But we also see that there were occasions in which others would benefit from this too. And so, you know, that kind of gives an interesting angle on it. Because sacrifice would be, in a sense, something sacrificial. I mean, 
Animals were very valuable. Animals were the type of asset that keeps on giving, okay? And so, so that's good. Um, I mean, a sheep's going to give you, you know, wool again and again and again. And so to, to give it is certainly giving an asset. But at the same time, it could, and, I, and I'm sure there were people who were saddened by this repeated sacrifice, especially because of what it taught them. You know, that they'd fallen short, that it was something to, to cover sin. And so they had that continual reminder. And um, so that oft-repeated thing. But at the same time, there was this side in which they would also, you know, benefit from it and have this fellowship, you know, with other, other believers as well. So it's interesting that we have that, that little peek into kind of like that, that sacrificial mode. Yes? <laughs> I, can, I can understand that too. <laughs> so we have an interesting thing here also, this finest cut of meat. If you check a couple of different translations, you, you see that there's some variation in the wording that they use for the meat. Some translations have shoulder, some have thigh, or even leg. And so I have thought to myself, you know, we think, you know, finest cut of meat, oh, this nice steak, this filet mignon or something like that. But when you use something like shoulder, thigh, or even leg, it's like, here, this is yours, you know. <laughs> and so it's going to be obvious to everybody, ooh, this guy got an extra portion here. So he, he's treated well. He's given this extra cut. Saul all the while is wondering what in the world is going on here. And um, so he gets this Im impressive uh, piece of food. So, so that's an that's a interesting meal right there. And then it goes on, and we see then that Samuel <coughs> demonstrates some real hospitality. He, they came down from this place of worship. They returned to town, and Samuel takes Saul to his house. Now it talks again about up to the roof of the house. So we have a little peek there again into the culture, the way houses were built. It was not uncommon to have flat roofs with a parapet around. It would be cooler at times. And as you can see, at times people would even sleep up there. And so prepared a bed up there for Saul. And then uh, he says at daybreak the next morning, he says, get up, it's time you're on your way. So we got up and he and Samuel left the house together. Now, hold on just one second. I wanted to emphasize one thing that I forgot. Let's emphasize this here again, verse 19. We will eat there together, and in the morning I'll tell you what you want to know and send you on your way. But it's not the donkeys, it's something else. He tells them about the donkeys. And so, <clears throat> so he takes them home. And this is interesting here. Some people make a lot of a, of, of a verse here in regard to going up to the roof, room, house, preparing a bed for him there, because... The Septuagint, which was a Greek translation of the Old Testament, was actually used at, during Jesus' day, um, actually had translated that phrase, that he spoke with Saul on the roof instead of prepared a bed for him there. Now, now, if you look at verse 26, it says, At daybreak the next morning he called to Saul, Get up. So Saul obviously slept there somewhat. How much conversation they had, we do not know. And um, we can't necessarily rule it out, just even though it says he prepared a bed for him there. I mean, throughout this, it seems to me that Samuel has been rather conversational with Saul. You know, he's been friendly <laughs> and, and open with him. And I, I'm just not getting the impression that, that Samuel was a personality to be feared necessarily unless you really realize this person was connected with God, and of course you should be concerned there, but he seemed like a welcoming person. Again, we, we don't know. We don't have given those details there. There's no reason to think that, uh, you know, otherwise. But he takes him up, demonstrates some hospitality, prepares a bed for him, and uh, he allows him to sleep there. It is likely they may have had some more conversation, but we don't know how much. 
because back in verse 19, as I mentioned, he had indicated that he would have a special message for him in the morning. And so something he was not going to tell him that night. And I really kind of wonder, I mean, do you think Saul slept at all? I mean, what a day. They'd given up looking for the donkeys. They come over here to see if this seer can help out. They end up with the feast. They have all this stuff told him about he's going to, you know, be the answer to, you know, the, the hopes and desires of the nation. And, he's, and then he's taken to his house and, you know, he's waiting for more to come. And so Saul has quite a day. And I, I really <laughs> do honestly wonder, you know, if he slept at all. And this chapter does not end with the morning message. The way this chapter ends with is that Saul, Samuel is going to seek to have a, a private conversation with Saul. So it says, when he reached the edge of town, Samuel told Saul to send his servant on the head. And after the servant was gone, Samuel said, stay here, for I received a special message for you from God. Which is going to be really amazing. <laughs> Absolutely mind-blowing, to be sure, for, uh, for Saul here. And that comes in this next chapter. And, and you're going to see a number of things there that God does to confirm his will. And uh, so Saul has no reason to question it. And, um, and, of course, we know also that much of the time he didn't really respond as well as he should. But we have a, a very interesting start here. And, I, and we also have one thing about Samuel that I think is interesting is that he really didn't want to appoint a king. You know, he really knew that allowing God to be their more direct leader was desirable. And, you know, he w I'm sure he was very happy giving them that warning from the Lord. But when the Lord said, no, go ahead, appoint them a king, then we seem to have Samuel absolutely very willing, you know, without resistance, to do the Lord's will. And to do it well. I mean, you know, in regard to honoring him at the feast and making all these arrangements, he, he put some effort into it. <coughs> And um, <coughs> sorry, and that's a good example, you know, for us as well. Any other thoughts that you have on this second half to chapter nine? <coughs> I think Samuel also knew Saul's response, how he was going to act, if he kept kind of cooking him so that way he didn't have to like run. Immediately. So, yeah, he was always like, well, this will happen next, or something like that. And he I'm sure he was observing him through all this as well. You know, one thing that's very interesting is that even though Samuel really didn't want to appoint a king, and even though I'm sure he saw that, that Saul had a lot of growing and development to do, we see. Uh, you know, in later chapters, how Samuel becomes very attached to Saul. I don't know if you remember, but later on, basically, the Lord tells him, I'm going to replace him. And, and Samuel is really very disappointed with that. And so, you know, he's, we, you know, it kind of makes you wonder, you know, is this the beginning of a friendship right here? Eventually, it's a close relationship, even though, He's not the best pupil, <laughs> but Samuel does care about him, and I'm sure he did his best to try to, you know, guide him. Other thoughts? All right, well, <clears throat> this is a miracle day. I am done three minutes early, and <laughs> you can have an extra cup of coffee this morning. Let's, <laughs> let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for how you've preserved this account for us. We do thank you for how you work in our lives and help us, Lord, to be submissive to your will and help us, Lord, to do it with enthusiasm and help us, Lord, to be, be like Samuel and help us, Father, to, 
just allow you to work in our lives, even though there may be things that we have to do that, that are difficult. Give us the courage to do it. Help us to have the wisdom to know how to do those things. And we pray that we would please you in our Christian walk and ask that you would continue to work in our lives to make us more like your son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.